On a dark and deserted battlefield, a giant dragon emerges from the smoke in all its CGI glory. The dragon is faced with a group of humans that are here to challenge it, but it calls them all foolish for even daring to think they could ever stand a chance in a fight with him. But the humans are determined and will not back down from it. The Shadow World represents the worst calamity known to man. It has slowly shrouded the world in a thick layer of black fog which is impossible to see through. We don't know what goes on in that black fog, but one thing we do know is that no living creatures can survive on the land it corrupts. So with the fog slowly devouring the earth, there is only one way for the humans to survive, and that is by conquering the Shadow World. And the current challenge before them, Boromir is the final obstacle to saving their world. Boromir charges up the fire blast and launches it towards the humans, but as they prepare for impact, the blast suddenly disappears as one of them uses his magic. Boromir is shocked by this but prepares to attack again regardless. However, Dazir is able to analyze the magic patterns within Boromir and use his special magic to seal all the dragon spells. As a result, a large chunk of Boromir's offense and defense has been sealed, allowing the rest of the party to attack with full force. Boromir tries to attack them again, but the tank is able to block it, leaving him defenseless to the damage dealers. And with a joint effort and combining all the magic power that they got, the swordswoman is able to finally slay the dragon. Boromir curses them all as he meets his end, and the sky finally returns to normal. The group sits together and celebrates their victory over the Shadow World, but they wonder why they haven't seen the level cleared message that would usually pop up by now. Dazir thinks it might just be taking a little more time than usual, so they should wait for it a bit since they killed Boromir. But even with their victory, the losses that they suffered along the way to get to this result are immeasurable. Of the 150 million people that came here to fight Boromir, only the six of them managed to survive. The tolls were heavy, but since they are meant to be celebrating, the priest wants to talk about something more lighthearted. And here is a sight for sore eyes, a hero party actually acknowledging the contributions of the main character in the fight. They praise Azir because without him being there to seal Boromir's magic, they would never have been able to defeat him. But with all the power that Dazir possesses, they ask why he had gone unknown in the war up until this point. He answers that it is because he was a commoner that no one took him seriously, which is a shame because if he had received more support to grow stronger, he could definitely have reached greater heights. They all talk about what they plan to do after they are able to return to Earth, so they ask Dazir what he plans to do next, maybe return to the Hebrian Academy for instance. Once asked this, he remembers his childhood friend and how she died on the battlefield, meaning he has nothing more he wishes to protect. But soon after, the boss music starts playing again and they realize something is still going on with the dragon. It doesn't make sense since they are all sure that they killed the dragon, but then the mage realizes what is going on. The dragon's heart stores an inconceivably large amount of mana which circulates through the body however, once killed, the heart will stop and all that mana now has nowhere to go. Meaning that the dragon's heart is turned into a high-grade nuke from which they cannot escape. In a desperate final attempt at survival, they prepare all their defenses against the blast, but in the end, they know that they cannot block a blast of that magnitude, and even Dazir's magic interference power can do nothing against a ball of pure magical energy. They all prepare to die and Dazir looks down at his hands wondering if this is really the end for him. However, after the blast, he opens his eyes once more and is surprised to see that he is not dead. He finds himself in a building and looks at his reflection, realizing that he is once again in his youth. He hears applause behind him and turns around to see that a speech is being given to the new students of Hebrian. Dazir recognizes the woman as Professor Bridget, and as she continues with the speech, she tells the students that not all of them will be enrolled in the academy as only 600 students are to be accepted. It will take a test to decide who those 600 will be, and as she announces the test, Dazir recalls it as well to clear a shadow world, proving to him that he is really in his past. He walks away from the crowd to try and process everything that just happened. The years of fighting, the destruction that befell the world, and all the people that died along the way, none of that has happened yet. After confirming that he actually isn't in a dream, he sits down to ponder what all this means, but he is brought out of his train of thought by this girl, Ladoria, who is the second-year student assigned to assist Dazir with his test. Dazir greets her and recognizes her as one of the geniuses of the academy. She wields fire magic and rank first in the academy entrance exam. While thinking about all that, he ended up staring at her for a bit too long, causing her to ask if anything is wrong, so he says he is just nervous about the test. Ladoria tells him not to be nervous because the shadow world they'll be going into is one that was artificially created to be suitable for a test. But as she checks his charts to see what his combat ability is, she notices that he is a commoner. She personally doesn't have a problem with him being a commoner, but with how the school works, even if he passes the test, he will be placed in the beta class. 
Desir remembers all about the discrimination at the academy and how all the nobles are put in the alpha class and all the commoners in the beta class. Due to this, even if you possess extraordinary talent like Desir does, you can't get a proper education because of your status, crushing the talent of many commoner mages. Before he can worry about that though, he still has to pass the entrance test. So Lidoria takes him to the exam hall where many other students are waiting to be tested as well. As Desir sees the room, he feels a sense of nostalgia for it. But Lidoria is a bit surprised by his lack of surprise after seeing such a big room. He tries to brush it off, saying he has seen something like this before, but Lidoria knows that what he is saying can't possibly be true since this place is the only one of its kind in the whole world as of now. She is a bit suspicious of him, but doesn't have time to ask any more about it since the exam is about to start soon. They hurry to the exam room, but before they can get there, they are stopped by this guy, Elheim. He and Lidoria don't get along at all, and she isn't trying to hide that fact. He tries to tick her off a bit by calling her short and slow, but despite all the insults he is throwing at her, she has still beaten him in a previous fight, so she hits him with the L plus ratio. Since he is clearly not winning the argument with Lidoria, he switches over to Desir and upon finding out that he is a commoner, mocks him greatly for it. He doesn't think Desir has what it takes to pass the entrance exam, but even if he did manage to pass by some miracle, he would still only end up in the beta class. Now that Elheim has said that, Lidoria has started to take it personally, and she tells Desir that he had better pass the entrance exam no matter what. They continue to the exam room, but Desir is still feeling a bit disillusioned with all that is going on since he still can't accept that this is his reality. However, as he gets to the room, he is spotted by his childhood friend. And at that moment, he decides to hell with how or why. I'm going to make sure that tragedy never happens again. He calls out to her as Romantica, but by this point in time, he had yet to actually meet her, so acting all friendly with her would be strange. So when she asks him how he knew her name, he explains it by saying they are in the same testing group and her name is displayed. She accepts it and wishes him good luck in the test and walks off. Lidoria tells Desir that he is going to be in Group D and gives him a briefing on the test he will be taking today. It is a race in the Erenci Plains, a beginner-level shadow world. But while it may be called a shadow world, it isn't nearly as dangerous as the real thing as it is created specifically for the purpose of testing students with safety systems in place. So upon taking any fatal damage, the student would be evacuated immediately and receive medical attention. The damage won't necessarily be coming from the shadow world either, since the use of magic and combat are allowed, the other students in the test are free to attack each other at will. Immediately after saying this, Elheim shows up again to mock Lidoria and tell her that there is no way that Desir will be able to pass, especially since his mentee is a magic knight, Aesist. The news that Aesis is a magic knight shocks Lidoria, but Desir already knows all about Aesis from the time they spent fighting together. She is an incredibly talented knight and can use vision magic, which is impossible to inverse. She was also a trustworthy teammate till the end, so Desir is happy to see her again, though she still isn't much of a talker. Elheim has claimed victory on this one and its Aesist has a very good track record and all the accolades of a magic knight, while right now, Desir, well, he's just Desir. Still, Lidoria says he just got lucky with a very skilled mentee, and that doesn't prove anything about his own ability, but he gives her an L and walks away with his first petty victory for the day. Once he is gone, Lidoria turns to Desir and tells him that frankly, his chances of winning against a magic knight are pretty slim, but even with those slim odds, he shouldn't lose heart and give up over it. An announcement is made over the intercoms that the test for Group D is about to begin, so they all head to the front of the portal and await its commencement. Desir takes one final look at Romantica for a reminder of what he is trying to protect, and as the portal opens, he walks inside and is teleported into the Shadow World. As he arrives in the shadow world, the rules of the game are explained to all participants. They are going to be racing to the edge of the shadow world to complete the test, however, only the first three people to cross the finish line will pass, where all forms of force or interference is permitted, but anyone who receives any fatal damage will be immediately disqualified from the test. Everyone is ready, so they all line up at the starting line. While lined up, Desir is next to Aesis and thinks about how she also managed to survive as long as him and died the same way as well. So there is a chance that she also came back with her future memories as well, but he can't be sure of it. Suddenly, Aesis calls out Desir's name, and that gets him excited because it might mean that she actually remembers him from the future. But upon asking how she knew his name, she says she saw it on the group test display. She tells him that his magic circle is of the lowest rank and his physical abilities are of the lowest level, so he will have no future here, even if he continues training hard. For how she is talking, Desir deduces that she likely doesn't have any of her future memories and she continues speaking, saying she noticed him staring at her a lot, but if it is because he is being cautious of her, then he doesn't have to worry because she has no intention of interfering with his race since she views him as weak. 
The countdown to the race begins and everyone gets ready to take off running, but as soon as the count hits zero, Aziz gets an immediate early lead and is followed by two others, leaving the rest in the dust. Desir and Romantica are left to play catch-up and are running side by side, but while running, Romantica accidentally knocks over a cute mob in the grass and marvels at how cute it is. This makes Desir smile because he remembers how much Romantica loves cute things, but from her perspective, she has never met this guy in her life, and he is talking to her an awful lot for an exam, so she concludes that Desir must be hitting on her and tells him to focus on the race instead of her. Desir agrees with her but says that at this rate, both of them will be disqualified from the race, but she tells him not to lump her in with himself, and that she won't get disqualified like him. He just smiles and nods, which makes Romantica even more angry, but he's having too much fun to care since he finally gets to spend time with her again. Suddenly, he notices something in the distance and immediately pushes Romantica out of the way, narrowly dodging a flaming arrow that was shot at her. The attacker is the last competitor who is trying to thin out his competition to give himself a better shot at victory, but as he fires another fire blast, Romantica counters with a wind spell and fires it at him. Both spells collide, kicking up a huge dust cloud, but through that dust, though the attacker's spell was destroyed, Romantica's spell is still on course and hits, eliminating him from the test and leaving only five participants. Romantica thanks Desir for his help with saving her just now, but she says by eliminating that guy, the score is now settled between them, so she doesn't owe him anything more. He just smiles and nods again, making her angry once more. Desir points out that the others are still quite a long way ahead of them in the race so she will need to hurry, if she wants to try and catch up to them, but she says there is no need for that since she has a way to deal with that problem. She had hoped to save this for a little bit later, but with how things have gone, she needs to stop them, so she uses her magic to launch a spell. Meanwhile, the professors are judging the students in a separate room and talk about how it is great that they have a magic knight in group D, but then another professor mentions that there is also a commoner in the group Desir, and they don't seem to like commoners at all, so they immediately think Desir is not going to pass the test, but Professor Bridget seems a little more intrigued by him. Near the front, Aziz is still in the lead of the race and is followed by two others. One of them has completely given up on all hope of ever passing Aziz, but at least if he keeps up his pace here, he will be able to stay within the top three and pass the test. However, suddenly, the wind starts to push them backwards, forcing him to plant his sword into the ground to keep from getting blown away by it. He looks forward to see how this is affecting Aziz, but she is simply cutting through the wind and continuing at her previous speed. Seeing her press forward, he is motivated to stand his ground and survive the wind. But that tree had other plans. The two people behind Aziz get eliminated, leaving only three participants in the game. With only three participants left in the game, they can all pass if they don't fight each other since there is no reward for eliminating someone. But who said logic had to apply, Romantica wants to eliminate Desir next just because she can. She tells him that he had better drop out of the test before he gets hurt, but Desir asks why she feels the need to go this far. And her reason is that the fact he keeps smiling pisses her off. She tells him once more to drop out before she hurts him, but he refuses. She is shocked that he still refuses to drop out after seeing what her magic can do, but Azir just keeps smiling, angering her more and more until she just decides to finish him off herself. She casts several magic circles in the air and uses wind strike on Azir. She is sure that the blast must have eliminated him, so she starts to walk away, but while doing so, Azir tells her that her ability to control multiple magic circles at once is pretty impressive. She turns around to see that he is completely unharmed from that attack and even worse, he starts lecturing her on how she should spend a little more time casting the spell, so that it turns out stronger. Because she cast the spell so fast, all he had to do was make a slight adjustment to the trajectory and it missed him entirely. She yells that it was probably just a coincidence that her previous blast had missed, but she will make sure that the next one will surely hit. However, with one wave of his hand, Tazir once again causes all the spells to miss him entirely. She realizes that what Desir is doing is inversing her spell, but she can't accept that he is able to do such a thing because Desir is meant to be at the lowest circle of magic, so it shouldn't be possible for him to use such advanced magic. She tries her spell again, but predictably, it does nothing to him and he easily destroys it, proving that he is indeed inversing her spell and is at a much higher level of skill than her. She must be regretting not just leaving him alone because now he has every right to eliminate her out of spite. However, she isn't planning on going out so easily and tries to overwhelm his ability to nullify her spells by firing off several of them at once, however. Desir has dealt with much worse and is still able to handle them and even has time to have an internal monologue thinking about how Romantica is definitely stronger than most students at the academy, but not strong enough to change her fate in the future. So she needs to become much stronger this time and to make that happen. Desir needs to be the one that wins this race. 
He finally gets a little serious and uses his power to nullify all of Romantica's spells along with her magic circles, and leaves her exhausted from all the magic she has used. He could eliminate her right now, but he still likes her, so he starts lecturing her on some things she forgot to take into account when she attacked him again. Vizier can do other things than just inverse spells, so he can cast regular spells as well, in this case, Grease on himself. Grease is a spell that negates friction for the target, but it is usually used as an attack to knock an enemy off his feet, so she wonders why he would use that on himself. Desir moves on to the second point. This is a race, not a battle, meaning you don't win unless you cross the finish line, so fighting here is only a waste of time. And lastly, even if you get severely damaged, you won't die here, so he is able to do something like launch a fire spell at himself. She starts saying it is crazy to hit yourself with a fire spell intentionally, but before she can finish, he has already launched himself, knocking her to the ground where she realizes that she just took an L here, and she can't even be mad about it. Meanwhile, Aegis is about to cross the finish line, but she notices that Desir is fast approaching her and realizes that at his current speed, he will catch up to and pass her soon, so she turns around and prepares to face him head-on while apologizing for calling him weak since he can clearly handle himself. She prepares several magic circles and intends to fire them, forcing him to deactivate the grease spell and begin trying to inverse the magic circles that she has cast. She realizes that he is taking control of her spells, so she fires them before he can take full control of all of them, forcing Desir to use the spells he controls to deflect most of the damage away from himself. Azist is impressed with his quick thinking and that he was able to avoid taking a fatal blow after all of that, but she still has to win so she intends to cast a spell quickly, so as to not give enough time to inverse it. She launches an attack at Desir, but he is once again able to take control and redirects it to explode behind him while simultaneously casting Grease on himself again. He then uses that force to launch himself forward and towards Aesis, but while she thinks he is coming in for an attack, he slips past, telling her not to focus too much on beating him, and crosses the finish line first. She lost sight of the goal of the game, and with that, he has now won the race and Aesis has received her first L, as well as Romantica who is still trying to make it to the finish in bouncy fashion. After the results of the matches have all been gathered, the teachers begin the totally not rigged class placements. Trust me bro. By some amount of sheer coincidence, all the commoners end up in beta class and the nobles in alpha class. What a crazy turn of events. The snobby teachers take great pleasure in being able to keep the commoners out of the alpha class, but the other teachers, including Professor Bridget, are against the complete segregation of all the commoners and nobles, so she has a special recommendation to make to the council. As Desir, although he is a commoner, came in first in his race while beating all the other noble candidates and even the knight, she would like to place him in alpha class. This seems to be a very progressive move and could lead to the change of the status quo. But never underestimate the ability of the snobby nobles to gatekeep, as Desir still ends up in beta class. He isn't too bothered by it since he was also in beta class last year, but what he is really worried about here is Romantica, as she is pretty distraught about her results. She was placed in beta class, along with the rest of the commoners in a classroom that looks like it survived a cluster bombing. The teacher for the class explains that magic circles are the metric for the power of a magician. He draws a diagram on the board to demonstrate the different magic circle levels, the highest is 7 and the lowest is 1, and with his snobby lips, he firmly states that all the commoners in class are weak, and you have to have a circle levels of at least 2 to be able to get into alpha class, but all of them only have a magic circle level of 1. However, Romantica is at level 2, so she doesn't understand why she was put in this class, and on top of that, she was put in the same class as Desir and right next to him as a matter of fact him and his annoying smile. Meanwhile, Desir thinks about the talk he had with Professor Bridget after the test. They met each other over some tea and Desir thanked her for all the help she has given him since she used to volunteer at the orphanage that he was in. She is happy he remembers her and congratulates him on beating Aesist. But despite clearly proving that he was way better than the average noble magician, she still could not get past the nobles to place him in alpha class. He knows the nobles here are religious in their gatekeeping, but if he was turned away from Alpha class despite being strong, then there are surely others in Beta class that are powerful, but were never given the adequate training to reach their true potential. So he's going to make it his mission to find those people and raise their talents in preparation for the disaster to come. Later that day, Romantica is sitting depressed over being in Beta class when this guy walks up to her. Donetta asks if she is Romantica Eru, daughter of Baron Eru, and after she confirms that, Donetta says he is a new student in Alpha class, and is here to invite her on his party. He joined the Blue Moon Party which is made up of the most talented people in Alpha class, so he wants her to join with him because her skills are excellent and she has a good lineage. 
This would be a good opportunity for her to get in with the Alpha class students, so she's about to accept the offer. But then, Donetta states his conditions. In return for inviting her into the Blue Moon party, he wants her to go out with him. He has known her for 20 seconds and has already asked her out. Romantica is shocked by this sudden proposal and backs away thinking he can't be serious about this. But he is very serious and says it was love at first sight when he laid his eyes on her in the test area. He thinks it's unfair that she was placed in beta class while she is a noble, so if she wants, she can come with him. She asks for some time to think about it, so Donna leaves her with a necklace as proof of his love and hopes to hear back from her soon. And as Romantica ponders what just happened, she gets startled by Desir that has popped up behind her. She falls to the ground and tells him not to sneak up on her like that, asking what he wants from her. Desir says he has the same proposal that Donna had for her, minus the going out part. She finds it funny that he would think she would accept to join his party after she just got invited to the Blue Moon party. But Desir remembers that the same thing happened to her in the past life and it was the biggest mistake she ever made so he is trying to stop her from doing it again. However, she is none the wiser to Desir's good intentions and just tells him to leave her alone. With no other options, he pulls out a letter and asks Romantika to read it when she is alone. She thinks this must be some kind of love letter, but Desir tells her to destroy the letter after she is done reading it for her own sake. This gets her curious, and she opens the letter after he leaves, but the look on her face tells me it was something she didn't want anyone to know about. While walking through the halls, Desir thinks about how Romantika will react to the letter he gave her, but she'll probably just get mad. He then notices a boy on a chair sitting outside, and he has finally found one of the other talented people he has been looking for. Pram was one of the fastest swordsmen on the battlefield in the future, and in that timeline, he had almost no training at all. So with the right training and motivation from Desir this time around, he can become so much more. As Desir is thinking all this, Romantika runs up to him and wants to ask where he got the information in that letter from, but Desir tells her to be quiet for a bit since the practice matches are about to begin. Romantika looks over at Pram and is absolutely smitten by the levels of cuteness she's witnessing. But to be clear, he's a boy despite all indicators saying otherwise. As the practice matches start, takes his time picking out a sword and picks a large sword, which is just as big as him. This shocks Desir because as he remembers, Pram didn't use that kind of sword on the battlefield. Romantika also wonders if he will actually be able to handle swinging around such a big sword and heavy sword, but they will get their answer soon as the match is about to begin. Pram introduces himself with the Alpha class student Percival, whom he is up against only interested in beating on a Beta class student that he thinks is weaker than him, so he skips the introduction and goes straight to the fight. However, despite being small, Pram packs a punch with his swings and surprises Percival as he is getting pushed back by a Beta class student and he can't handle that kind of embarrassment, so goes on a full force attack. However, the Pram is still able to hold his ground and would be a clear winner for the match if he wasn't so inexperienced with the Great Sword, once again making Desir question why he isn't using his normal weapon. Pram is still leading the match due to his strength and power alone, but after some back and forth with Percival, Pram's inexperience with such a big sword finally catches up to him and he swings wildly, missing the mark altogether and being unable to regain his balance. This gives Percival the chance to counter and knock him to the ground, but he knows he just got lucky. Pram admits defeat as his sword has been knocked out of his hand, but Percival's pride has been hurt considering Pram is way more talented than him. So he starts punching him, prompting Desir to jump into the arena to save him while the world's most useless referee stands there and does nothing. Desir was quite far, so Pram had to take a few punches before he was able to arrive and get between them. He tells Percival to back off since he has already won the match and calls him jealous of Pram's talent. This angers him and he tries to hit Desir on the head, but he just blocks the blow, breaking the sword in the process and giving Percival the look of, leave now, or you are dead. Percival gets the message and backs off for now, saying he will never forget Desir's face. After that whole mess, Pram and Romantika take Desir to a waiting room to get him bandaged up after the injury he sustained on his arm from that block. However, it's not as bad as you would think since he used magic to absorb most of the damage, so the harm done to him was minimal. But even with that being the case, his arm is still going to take a while to heal. So Pram still apologizes for getting him involved and also for making an enemy out of one of the Alpha class students. Through his heartfelt apology, all Romantika could think about is how cute he is. Pram introduces himself to Desir, but before Desir can do the same, Romantika steps in and introduces herself first, and she keeps doing this throughout Pram and Desir's conversation because of how cute he is. After their introductory conversation, Pram thanks Desir once again for his help today and says if there is anything that he ever needs him for, do not hesitate to call on him. Desir says he appreciates it and will definitely be taking him up on that offer, and as Pram leaves, he looks to Romantika and asks her if she wants to talk now. 
They head to the back of a school building and Romantica asks if he told anyone else about the contents of the letter he wrote. He says he hasn't, but that the snobby professors are aware of it, and that is why they put her in beta class to spike her skills. Romantica's secret is that her father was a merchant who made a Fortune 500 company and was rolling in the big bucks. So to have a better life with his daughter, he bought a noble title from a poor noble family and received the name Eru. While he is indeed a noble now, the snobbiest of the snobby nobles don't see it that way and are always ready to gatekeep a commoner even if they are filthy rich. For this reason, Desir wants Romantica to reject the offer from Donata because Blue Moon is only open to nobles, and once they find out about this, those gates will shut on her harder than anything she's ever experienced. And if she thinks she can have Donetta protect her, he is just as bad as the other nobles when it comes to treatment of commoners. So Desir once again extends the offer to have her join his party, making Romantica think he plans to blackmail her with the information he has. But no, Desir is too classy for that and has another card of his sleeve. Pram, if Pram is going to be there as well, then she agrees to join since he makes a valid point. But she makes it clear that she still finds him to be really annoying. We see a memory of Pram with his mother as she tries to convince him that his father still loves him despite leaving for the milk and never looking back. At the very least, he was left with a sword, which his mom says was a gift from his father, proving that he is indeed loved by him. As long as the sword exists, it will serve as proof that his father still thinks about him and cares for him. Well, there goes the sword. At the same time, the mood of the dream shifts, and as his mother says he loves you over and over again, Pram realizes something. The grocery store is closed on Sundays. Pran wakes up from the nightmare, but reality can often be crueler, as he has that sword on his wall, but still no milk. Later that day, Desir takes Romantika and Pram to an office to get their party officially formed, and as he knocks on the door, he is told to come in by Professor Bridget. She tells them to all sit and provide snacks for them before getting down to business. She asks Desir why he wants to form a party here, and he immediately answers saying he wants to get promoted to the Alpha class by winning the next ranking exam. Pram asks if it is really all that hard to win the ranking exams, so Professor Bridget explains the principle. The ranking exam is a tournament to determine the ranks of the students in each grade, and is held between both Alpha and Beta class students. The requirements for participation are teams of three to six students where the parties engage in battles against one another, and the winner gets to rank up with each victory. That puts parties with six members at a considerable advantage, but individual achievements and supporting teammates also play a role in determining your level contribution to the victory of your team's success. The point of the tournament is to assess the various skills of the students, but all of that is just the qualifier rounds. Those who successfully qualify will move on to the final battle which takes place in a shadow world. The top man of the battle are given the title of single rankers, and as a single rankers, one would be able to advance from beta to alpha class which is what Desir is aiming for. But unsurprisingly, the poor beta class students with no support given have managed to advance to alpha class exactly zero times since the school was formed. And additionally, all the students that make it to the finals have always been from alpha class, so statistically, their chances of winning the tournament are smaller than my PP. However, that is exactly why Desir wants to do it, because with such slim chances, if they were to win the tournament with the minimum number of party members allowed, it would send a message and prove the other professors who say that beta class students are too stupid to be worth teaching are wrong. Professor Bridget supports his plan and thinks it would be great if they could become single rankers because it might finally lead to some good change in the school's unfair policies. She turns to Romantica and Pram and informs them that party formation requires direct confirmation of intent to join the party from all members, so she asks if they are fully prepared to be a part of Desir's party after hearing what he plans to do. They obviously agree and all head over to the training grounds. There is a wide open space which provides an especially conducive environment for people to train their sword and magic skills. And then there's this. The other place is only for Alpha students, so they are left with this murder scene of a room. And on top of the cobwebs, creaking floors, and high likelihood to find a body somewhere in here, there is also an army of rats just chilling here. They can handle many things, but rats are not one of them. Pram passes out, and Romantika jumps on Desir, begging him to not force them to use this room. He agrees that the rats are a problem, but there aren't any other rooms available for them to use, and Professor Bridget had to personally find this one for them so they're kinda stuck with it. However, rats are a definite no-go for Romantika and she's not gonna deal with it, so with things as they are, Desir tells her that he'll deal with the rats, but the cleaning is going to be up to her, meaning they are still stuck here. Pran faints again, and by the time he wakes up, the room has been cleaned spotless and Romantika looks like she has seen some shit. Pram is really apologetic for being unconscious and not helping them out at all, but Desir says it's fine and they should all head back to start training. 
Romantica really doesn't want to train after all she has been through, but it is necessary if they are going to become single rankers. She is starting to regret joining the party, but agrees to do it anyway. Her first training lesson will involve improving her magic accuracy, but she says she is already pretty good at that and summons seven magic circles, proclaiming she can handle all of them. Desir says that's great, but instructs her to fire all of them at once and hit the target, which she does. But they don't all hit the center, so that will be her first training target. She thinks it will be impossible to aim all the spells at the exact same spot, but Desir knows she is capable of it since her future self pulled off that exact feat against a monster once. She still isn't confident in her ability to do it, so Desir jokingly says she can just be the room cleaner if she doesn't want train with them, so she finally caves and agrees to do whatever he tells her to do for training. And this is where her training begins with a white ball which she has to move into another circle. She tries just throwing it at first, but Desir clarifies that she has to use magic to do it otherwise she won't accomplish anything. She has to manipulate the air currents around the room to move the ball which shouldn't be too hard since wind magic is her specialty. She agrees to give it a try and starts the exercise and after a few moments is able to make the ball move. Desir compliments her on a job well done and tells her to keep repeating the action until she perfects it while he moves on to Pram's training. But while Pram is excited to see what kind of training Desir could have in store for him, Desir says there is nothing for him to teach Pram. Pram has already perfected his sword technique and is strong enough to win the tournament as he is now, but Pram doesn't think so considering his previous loss. Everything Desir said is true, and it all depends on Pram using his full potential. In the future, he tore through his enemies with nothing but a rapier, so he questions why he would choose a big sword in battle. He clearly wasn't used to it and could move around well with it, so using a rapier would make much more sense for his combat style. Pram doesn't really want to talk about it, but Desir tells him it's for the good of the team, so he would like to know, so Pram asks to speak with him privately. He takes him to his room where the rapier that his father left for him is. He has never seen his father's face since he was a noble and Pram's mother was a commoner, so the only thing his father left behind for him was this rapier. Desir recognizes the weapon as the one which Pram used in the future, so he asks to see it up close. Pram first learned about the sword when he was six and taking it as a sign of his father's love, he went down the path of the sword and trained tirelessly in hopes that he would one day reunite with his father and be a son whom he could take pride in. However, as his mother was on her deathbed, she told Pram to never go looking for his father because he lives in a completely different world from him and would only cause trouble for him. For nobility, a child of the commoner would be a complete disgrace, so if Pram had tried to visit his father, he likely wouldn't have come back alive in an attempt to keep the being an illegitimate son quiet. Desir realizes that Pram's mom probably knew what would happen if he ever found his father, which is why she tried to discourage him from looking. Pram came to the academy in order to find his father since nobles from many different countries come here and he had hoped to find some clues on who he was. While here, he went to an appraiser with the sword to try getting some clues from it, but the appraiser informed him that the sword had almost no value at all. Pram was devastated that the sword he had treasured as his father's one sign of love towards him was nothing more than a glorified paperweight. After that discovery, he gave up on finding his father and swears that he will never use that sword again. The next day, while training, Pram is using a different sword which is smaller than the giant one he used before, and Romantica has gotten a lot better at moving the ball around with her magic, but still has a long way to go with her accuracy. However, Desir suddenly remembers something and goes over to Pram to ask to see the rapier again because he wants to confirm something, but Pram says he won't be able to see it because it was already sold. We see Desir walking along the old town road he used to know and reminds reminiscing over the time he spent here in the previous timeline. Then Pram directs him to go down an alleyway which he has never been on before. He is led to a pawn shop which has a sign outside saying no refunds whatsoever, meaning this place is obsessed with money, and if you came here to buy a phone, you would probably find a G phone of 15. As they stand at the entrance, Pram tells Desir he doesn't want to ever hold that sword again, but Desir knows that the sword is too insanely valuable for him to lose and he isn't going to let Pram basically spend 16 Bitcoin on a sandwich. They head inside and knock on the door and are greeted by this big black man who invites them as customers. The store owner Ruju greets them and recalls that he met Pram yesterday while he hasn't seen Desir before. He asks if they are here to buy or sell an item and Desir responds that they are here to get the sword Pram sold yesterday. Wuju reminds them of the no-refunds policy, but Desir was aware of that and says they are here to buy it. The man smiles and pulls out the sword, recounting that he had told Pram that the sword had no value as a sword, but there is something incredibly valuable about it which Pram is shocked to hear. Desir says it's a Kimuvin which surprises the man as didn't think Desir would know about those. They are like gifts that nobles usually give to people whom they love, and as he continues to speak, Pram starts to really that he done fucked up. 
Dazir gets down to business and asks him how much it costs, to which Wuju responds saying it costs 40 silver. Prem is outraged because he only received 3 silver for it, but the man retorts that he paid for his sword, which this thing is worthless as, but right now, he is selling it as a Kamuvin. So Pram just got swindled, and the dude tells him tough luck kid. Dazir knows how things go and just gives the man the money he's asking for and buys the sword. The dude is surprised that Dazir bought it with no hesitation at all, but he is still sure that he won't be able to figure out how to use that thing, since he also couldn't. However, Dazir analyzes it and hands it to Pram who is hesitant to take it, but he decides to trust Dazir. Dazir instructs him to remove the sheath of the sword, and as he does, he sees the sword glow in a brilliant blue light, shocking even Wuju. The blade is made of neither iron nor steel. It is made from a metal known as Blancium. It is harder than steel, but lighter than a feather and only used to make the finest of weapons imaginable. They are about to leave, but Wuju is salty about losing out on such an amazing sword and threatens them to leave it behind because he wants it back or his guard is going to beat them up. Dazir points out that things here are sold as is and a payment was already made, so in his own words, tough luck old man. Wuju instructs his guard to take the sword back from them, and the guard immediately attacks Dazir, but he is able to dodge it easily. Wuju yells for the guard to take care of the two of them already, but Pram gets in front of Dazir and says he will protect him. However, this whole thing could have been avoided by just waiting until you were outside to check out how great the sword is. Regardless, Pram isn't going to hold back against the guard. The guard charges forward to swing at Pram, but in an instant, Pram disappears and the barbarian hits nothing but air. While the fight is going on, Dazir watches and thinks about how well the sword suits Pram, but even with such great speed, if a single one of those hits were to land, it could easily kill him, so he has to be extremely careful with how he dodges. Pram begins to charge up his power to attack once more, and the barbarian is beginning to enjoy the fight and starts to really get into it, acknowledging him as a warrior. He swings his sword for a huge strike. But Pram is too fast and blitzes his way behind the Barbarian while performing his own slashes. The Barbarian recognizes that Pram is much faster than him and goes into a defensive stance to block all of the incoming strikes. But even with the hail of strikes coming his way, the Barbarian is still having a lot of fun with the fight. Pram leaps back after completing his attacks, but all the strikes were only flesh wounds on the Barbarian's body. He has to aim for a vital spot and he intends to take him out, so he goes for a vital spot. However, with his lack of experience, the Barbarian easily sees through the attack. Pram gets kicked back to the edge of the shop which is ridiculously spacious and falls to his knees, but the Dazir calls out to him saying he should believe in his father and the intentions he had when he gave him the sword. Pram gets up once more and raises his sword to fight. He doesn't know why his father gave him the sword or what the inscriptions on it say, but he will trust that his father believed in him and do everything possible to gain victory with the sword he gave him. He charges at the Barbarian again and has the bug sword swung at him, but this time he can tell that it is a trap and as the giant switches to a punch, he is able to evade and get behind him. He charges again, but the Barbarian sees it coming and prepares a counterattack. However, Pram counters the counterattack and slices the sword in half and knocks the Barbarian out. Dazir congratulates Pram on a job well done and they prepare to leave, but Wuju laughs and says that door is fortified and the only way they will be getting out of here is if they leave the sword behind. However, Pram goes with his own option and just cuts the door down. As they leave, Dizir asks Pram if he is hungry so they can get something to eat out in town. He walks over to a meat stand and buys two long sticks of meat for him and Pram to enjoy. Pram thanks him for the meat but also for helping him get his sword back and believing in him. Dizir says it's only natural for him to do so because they are in a party together and party members look out for each other. Pram is brought to tears by Dazir's words since a whole lot of tragic stuff happened to him before he got here and he was even scammed shortly after. But now he has someone whom he can call a friend and has his back whenever he is in trouble, and that makes him really happy. Meanwhile, back at the training room, Romantika has finally managed to accomplish the goal of getting the ball in the circle with magic, but as she celebrates, she realizes that no one was there to record and post it to YouTube, so did it even happen? After she's done being upset, she gets up and tries to go for the other training method that Dazir had proposed and pulls up several magic spells at once, firing them all at the same spot and managing to successfully complete them. She is proud of herself, but there is still something that she has to do, so she heads to an alpha class cafeteria to meet Danetta. They head to the cafeteria and he treats her to a meal as he asks if she has finally come up with an answer to his proposition. She says she has, but it may not be what he is expecting as she has come to turn down his proposal. He asks if this means she doesn't want to go out with him, and while that is true, she also has another reason. She joined a party in beta class, and though she didn't really like it at first, she is starting to have fun now, 
She also brings up that Donata had said all the students in beta class were nothing but trash, which he still believes, but Romantika drops the truth and tells him that she used to be a commoner as well. And I've never seen someone's face change so quickly. He skipped all the stages and went straight to disgust. He regains his composure and thinks she must have been joking when she said that, but she was really serious about it. That is why she was put in beta class even though she's a noble. But she's fine with being in beta class since her party members wouldn't look at her in disgust like he just did. Donetta says he wouldn't have invited her to join if he had known she was a commoner and Romantika gets up to leave, commenting on how Desir was right about what Donetta's reaction would be. Before she leaves, she tells him that her party plans to get promoted to alpha class, so that makes them enemies from now on, and also thanks him for the delicious food. And Donetta is seething rage as he recalls the reason why he hates the commoners, as during a revolution, they had killed his parents right before his eyes. So we move on to the next phase of the plan, the ranking tournament qualifiers. And with the team Desir has formed, they are completely obliterating the competition, moving through the ranks faster than the housing crash, moving from the 150 to the top 30 with their impressive power and teamwork. And Professor Bridget couldn't be more happy with how things have played out, but they had better be prepared to take the next step, because the nobles are definitely going to be targeting them now. As the news of a beta class team making it to the 30th position in the qualifying ranking tournament spreads, it is publicized in the newspapers, and the head of the Blue Moon group is livid that the beta class is actually doing well for once. He can't have those commoner plebeians stay in his precious alpha class, so from this moment on, he's got beef. He orders them to make sure not a single member of that beta class team is able to survive in the finals, so they will not be able to become single rankers, and thus never get into alpha class. He puts Azest in charge of this important mission as she has fought Desir in the past and asks her if she will be able to win this time. She confidently says she will do it, but to be clear, she doesn't have beef with commoners, she is personally hating on Desir since he was the first person to ever defeat her in a contest, so she wants a rematch. As she leaves the office, she is approved by Donetta and Percival, who wish to have a word with her. She believes they have a problem with her being the leader, but that isn't the issue. They also had their run-ins with the people in Desir's party, and we might as well call this a barbecue with all the beef these guys are carrying. They tell her they have no issues with her being the leader, but Romantika and Pram should be left to them to handle. They know their chances of winning are reduced by fighting one-on-one -on -one matches, but their egos have been bruised and they can't let that go unpunished. Azis doesn't like their flawed judgement, but it's not like she's any better than them with how she's going for a rematch with Desir. Meanwhile, Desir is strategizing on how next to boost the team's battle capabilities. He thinks they have raised their skills enough for now, so he wants to move on to the next step and meets with them to pass on the change in routine. There will be no training today, instead they shall be heading to the library to study history. Romantika has the same reaction I did during history exams and can't believe she has to read all these thick and heavy books. The reason behind this impromptu study session is the fact that Shadow Worlds incorporate certain historical aspects into their operation. So if you are aware of the events that are about to take place and can stop them before they happen, then you will be in good shape to win the game. Still, they don't actually know what the game The Shadow World is going to be based on, so there is no way to be sure about which historical events to read about. Desir says he is aware of that, and for that reason, he picked out some historical events for them to read up on at random. Romantica doesn't like the idea that they are basing their chances of victory solely on Desir's intuition. But then again, the alternative is reading that entire shelf of books, so she is suddenly more than happy to rely on Desir's choices. Though his choices weren't actually random since he knows for a fact what the challenge they will be faced with is going to be. They continue with their studying and hours later, Pram is looking at Desir in some type of way and it's so obvious that even Romantika is able to see it. She starts to tease him with the shopping trip he and Desir went on previously, and how they probably grabbed something to eat as well. Which is true since they bought some meat sticks, but Pram was probably after Desir's meat stick. Romantika keeps pressuring Pram to tell her what he thinks about Desir and Desir, who is sitting right across from them, has to pretend he can't hear what they are saying. They continue to get rowdier until they accidentally send a book flying up and into the air, landing on Desir's head, and forcing him to acknowledge their conversation about him. He just smiles and tells them to get back to reading, which they both agree to do slightly intimidated. They get back to studying, but a while later, Azaz shows up and stands beside Desir. Romantika and Pram have got no idea what she is doing here, but she simply ignores them and goes greets Desir. It has been around two months since they last spoke and he congratulates her on joining the Blue Moon party, but she doesn't see it as anything praiseworthy. She says that she's so here to declare war on Desir, but he already knew it was coming. It is very much like her to come personally challenge someone who she acknowledges as a rival, 
even if they are meant to be enemies. Since he seems to understand her well enough, she gets to the point and apologizes for underestimating him in their previous competition, while also promising not to make the same mistake again. This time, she's gonna make sure she beats him, and that's exactly the kind of attitude Azir likes to see. In their last fight, he had pushed himself a little farther than normal in order to spark her competitive spirit and drive her to become even stronger than she was in the other timeline. Sparking her competitive spirit, on the day of the ranking tournament, the stadium is at max capacity as the people are eager to watch such a spectacle unfold before their eyes. Pram and Romantika comment on how noisy it is outside, but that's only natural considering this is the final round of a very important competition. With that being the case, even he has to go all out if he wants them to stand a chance at winning, but the others don't seem to be too nervous, so he feels confident that they can accomplish their goal. They head out to the cheering crowds and stand in line before the match begins. While they wait, the members of Blue Moon take a look at Desir and don't think he is all that much of a big deal for them to handle by themselves. But they were warned not to take him lightly, so they'll do everything they can to crush him immediately. Soon after, the match announcer declares that the players should get into their position while it explains the rules. They are going to be teleported into a shadow world where the goal is to solve a certain incident, but they won't elaborate on what that incident could be to keep the game challenging. While the game is going on, all acts of violence against other players are permitted, be it fighting, using heavy-duty artillery, or roasting someone on Twitter for extra emotional damage. However, if you receive fatal damage from the attacks, you will immediately be disqualified and transported out of the Shadow World, and to a therapist if needed. Those who contribute greatly to the clearing of the Shadow World will receive more points for their efforts, and the top 9 people with the most points will earn the title of Single Rankers. However, on the leaderboard right now, Desir and his team are at the very bottom, so if they want to succeed in becoming single rankers, they need to either clear the Shadow World on their own, or beat everyone here, and be the last one standing. The gates to begin the game open, and they are instructed to head inside in orderly fashion. However, as the team enters the world, Desir finds that he has been separated from everyone else. The announcer makes a statement to all the participants, informing them that the locations which they were teleported to are completely randomly generated, so best of luck to them all. So now the first order of business for Desir is to find both Pram and Romantika, and then complete their team formation, but before he can move forward, he has an ice bolt shot at his head. It appears he was teleported to the same area as one of the Blue Moon members, so she's going to try her best to take him out early on in the round. She fires another ice spell at him, which he counters with fire. She then steps back and begins casting two spells at the same time, firing a water spell, and then an ice spell to freeze the water, sending hundreds of ice shards towards Desir. But she wasn't done yet because she then layers on a wind spell, forming a tornado around him and effectively creating a human cheese grater. She is proud of herself and proudly says this is the kind of magic a commoner could never use. Desir says she is pretty impressive, but just one problem, her aim is trash and her keyed ratio is 0.2. She gets defensive about it, but Desir has her all figured out and simply snaps his fingers, destroying her spell altogether. She is left speechless at the fact her most powerful spell was defeated so easily, and this is where she realized that Desir is way above her league. Desir takes her spell and uses it against her, but she is still adamant that a commoner like him could never truly defeat her, so she puts up a shield to defend herself. However, Desir shows her what it means to have aim better than a toddler and directs the ice spikes to go around the shield, not only hitting her with full force, but also haunting her with the knowledge that the world now has this picture of her face. So one opponent has now been eliminated and only 29 more to go. Another one of the students got sent into a field and begins complaining about his beautiful skin getting sunburned out here, but at least there's a light breeze blowing through. All of a sudden, the breeze doesn't seem very light as he gets sucker punched into next week by a wind blast by Romantika. He is eliminated by the damage he takes and that leaves only 27 participants left in the game. Pram and Romantika look around for Desir, but they can't find him anywhere. Much to Pram's disappointment. They must have just gotten lucky to have been transported so close to one another on the battlefield. The same can't be said for Desir, so they're just going to have to do their best until they can reunite. Romantika resumes her light breeze radar and locates two other enemies together, and one alone nearby, so she decides to target the lone player. However, as the blast closed in on the unsuspecting victim, it suddenly turned a familiar shade of red and dissipated into nothing. At the same time from behind, the two players together have found Pram and Romantika since wide-range detection spells all have the downside of revealing users' location as well. They joke that they probably weren't aware of such basic knowledge because they are so dumb, but Romantika challenges them to see who the real dumbass here is. They think they are stronger simply because their opponents are in beta class, but she wonders where they get such confidence from. 
But before the guy could begin his monologue on how he is superior to them in every way, Pram takes the opportunity to go for a sneak attack while his defense on the swordsman, but it gets blocked since the guy is actually pretty strong. Pram is pushed back and regroups with Romantica, while the magician asks the swordsman if he is alright, so he informs her that he is fine, and it would take more than something like a weak beta student to keep him down. He tells his partner not to let her guard down though as they are about to engage in combat now. He dashes forward and clashes swords with Pram but is unable to gain any ground on him so he leaps back to give the magician a chance to fire off a magic spell at Pram. As the spell approaches him, Pram prepares himself and begins dodging out of the way and dashing around them so fast that all they can see of him is a faint blur. The Alpha class students are starting to wonder if this is really something a Beta class student is really capable of, but the swordsman refuses to accept it. He strikes the ground with his sword to create a dust cloud for cover, then he asks the magician to perform an area of effect spell to stop Pram from zipping around them. But as soon as she starts casting her spell, Romantica gets a read on her magic and snipes her so badly that we're going to need to replay it for the highlight reel. It was pretty dumb for them to go through all the trouble of creating a dust cloud to hide their location, but then use magic while someone who they know can use magic radar is present. He gets enraged and is about to go after Romantica, but Pram appears behind him, telling him it's not wise to let yourself get distracted in the middle of the fight. But then as he turns to face Pram, he is reminded that Romantica is still there and long story short, he got his ass jumped. If he had gone after Romantica first, he might have been able to take her out, but he underestimated them and lost because of it. The fact that all the Alpha students are so arrogant is actually working out in their favor, so they hope the Alpha class remains as simple-minded as they've been up to this point. With the battle finally over, she yells for Desir to show himself because she knows he has been watching them fight this entire time. He apologizes, but he just got too engrossed watching them, he praises Romantica and Pram for their excellent skill, patting Pram on the head as a reward. He was waiting to see if they needed help so he could join in and perform a coordinated jumping, but it seems he wasn't needed at all. Ronantika thinks back to what happened with her spell earlier, and even though she had thought she was getting stronger, Desir was still able to instantly inverse her spell, showing that there is still a massive gap between their abilities. Even though they are on the same team, it still annoys her how Desir is so effortlessly strong compared to her, but while she is lost in thought, Desir takes her silence to mean that she also wanted head pats so he happily obliges, but after realizing what's going on, Romantika gets really embarrassed by it and turns away, telling Desir to never touch her head again, but he just smiles in response. Anyway, their trials aren't over yet as the theme of the Shadow World is about to take effect. Elsewhere in the forest, a student has been eliminated by an Alpha class team, but the leader assures him that he holds no personal grudge against the guy, it was just bad luck that he happened to be on an opposing team to them. Desir and the others hear the announcement that another student has been eliminated, but they have more important things to think about, so Desir continues to explain their goals for ranking up from this competition. One way to do it is to beat the Shadow World altogether, but alternatively, they could also just place within the top 9 of the event to rank up. Romantica asks if they have a chance at clearing the Shadow World, but Desir laughs saying they got no chance in hell of pulling that off, all the Alpha class students would gang up on them as soon as they realized they were trying to clear the Shadow World. Their only shot at ranking up is to remain within the top 9 by the end of the event, and as long as they don't make themselves a clear target for the others, the Alpha class team should inevitably take themselves out. Right now there are 18 players left in the Shadow World, so if 9 more were to be eliminated, then they would have achieved their goal for the game. But it is far easier said than done. Still, Pram is confident that they will be able to pull it off somehow. It suddenly starts raining heavily, and they are forced to run for cover in the meantime. It doesn't look like the weather will be clearing up anytime soon, so it looks like they are stuck here for a while. While they stand under a tree, Romantika thinks about how Desir has been a huge help to her. If she was by herself, there is no way she would have ever even so much as thought about being in the top 9 of Alpha class, and if she had joined Dometa back when he first invited her, he would have found out about her being a commoner and considering his reaction when she told him about it herself, she is glad she listened to Desir, otherwise who knows what could have happened to her. And as if sensing what she is thinking about, Desir puts his hand on both their heads and assures that they are both strong, reassuring Romantika. But she reminds Desir that she said she doesn't like head pats, and she still doesn't like Desir's face. Pram, on the other hand, loves them though. The clock tower begins to ring, signifying the beginning of the calamity of this shadow world. From the studying he had them do, they know that this place is previous clock tower, and the tower itself is a high-level magic device that produces monsters at regular intervals. This is part of the survival quest of the shadow world, and the noble professors are sure that beta class will be eliminated with this next phase. In the distance, Desir and his party hear a scream coming from the distance, 
and he already knows what that means. He warns Pram and Romantika to be on their guard as something horrendous is approaching. A rat. Romantika and Pram still have PTSD from the rats they had to clean, but this time, even Desir is too scared to face them and tells the others to run if they don't want to become rat food. They run into a log and are forced to jump over it, but while Pram and Desir are able to clear it easily, Romantika falls flat in her face and needs to be helped up. The rats are closing in, but the only way to beat it is to kill Threat in command. But it is shielded by thousands of smaller rats, so striking it down is almost impossible while it is inside there. However, Desir knows of a way to draw that thing out and bites his finger to use a drop in his blood as bait. The rat gets a whiff of the tasty human blood and leaps out of the horde to get a taste, but it gets smacked out of the air by Romantika. Instead of double tapping the thing, Romantika is celebrated a little too early as the rat regained consciousness and returned to its horde. If even Romantika can't kill it in one blow right now, Desir decides it will be better for the team to retreat until they can come up with a better strategy to take this thing out. However, before he can give the order, Pram runs past him and jumps straight into the rat horde. No one in the world could convince me to do something like that, but Pram went in and got swallowed up by the rats. The same thing was happening all over the map as the other students faced the same challenge. But Pram hadn't been eliminated yet. The rats swarmed around him, but while in there he was able to focus on the presence of the commander rat, and while Desir was still frantically trying to save him from the rat horde, he leaps out having defeated it. Desir is happy to see that Pram is alright, but what he just did left him extremely exhausted, so they put him down to rest for a bit. Once he has recovered enough, the team continues on and heads towards the previous clock tower. Blue Moon has also arrived at the clock tower and realizes that they'll win if they manage to stop it, so they plan to do just that. However, before they can put their plan into motion, they suddenly feel a gust of wind blowing their direction. Azes realized that this was no ordinary wind gust and immediately put up an ice wall to defend against the incoming attack. The others put their guard up as well, but while Percival and Donetta were able to survive, the two other background characters were immediately defeated. Azes knows it's an enemy attack but she can't understand how anyone could detect them and fire off several attacks so quickly. The only one she can think of that could pull that off would be Desir's team. With that last attack, they have successfully eliminated two more people leaving only 15 in the game. Azis and her team charge toward the location of Desir as they are pelted with more wind blasts from Romantica. Now, now that they are expecting it, they are able to counter the blasts consistently. Azis was even able to defend against the surprise curveball Romantica threw, so it's safe to say that nothing they do will get to them anymore. And to make it worse, their position has been completely exposed thanks to their constant firing, so Blue Moon will soon arrive to attack them. However, doesn't mind that and instructs Romantika to begin firing at the other teams. She is confused by his request since something like that would only end up drawing the rest of the teams right to their location. But she does it anyway, since she trusts Desir's judgment. This leaves only 13 players in the game. With that done, Desir heads back inside to begin using his hacking on a secret door. Meanwhile, Blue Moon makes their way into the tower and only find the other Alpha class teams attacking each other. They shift their attention to the Blue Moon, blaming them for the sneak attacks they've been suffering this entire time. Azaz tries to deny their accusations, but they don't believe her for a second, because the only one skilled enough to pull something like that off is her. She realizes it would be pointless to tell them that it was Desir's team because in their eyes, there is no way someone from Beta class could ever achieve such a feat. This was Desir's plan from the beginning to antagonize Blue Moon and gets them to face off against the other team so they'll eliminate one another. Seeing no way to avoid conflict here, Azaz tells the other two to stand back so she can handle the situation herself. The Fire Mage attacks her at full power, but it wasn't even close to dealing enough damage to defeat her. So she runs up behind enemy team members and punts them away before freezing the body of another. The Fire Mage calls out to the Line Tree team to get them to help him out a bit since if they don't beat Azaz here, they won't be able to win this tournament. The two parties team up against Azaz, but even with their numbers advantage, the odd are tipped vastly in her favor. The fight goes on as Desir and the others listen in from the floor above. But as the other two parties are silenced and the battle seems to be over, Desir realizes that his plan didn't work. Azis and her team walk up the stairs to face Desir's team and commends him for his well thought out plan. But unfortunately for him, she figured out that he was hoping to get the Alpha class students to friendly fire themselves so the competition would be whittled down but instead, she simply froze them all in place to prevent them from being eliminated. She is slight miff that that was what Desir came up with to win since she has been wanting a rematch with him, so she gives him nowhere to run and casts two ice pillars to get him alone for a fight, leaving Pram and Romantico with Demeta and Percival. 
With their leaders gone, Percival immediately charges at Pram and Donetta stares down Romantica as the two prepare to settle their beefs. On the next floor, Desir is sprawled out on the floor, but Azes walks up to him knowing fully well that what she just did wasn't enough to take him out. Desir gives up on the act and casts some stone magic at her, forcing her to counter it with her ice magic. But that gave him enough time to be able to get back on his feet and begin hacking. Yet internally, he seems to only be buying time for something. Down below, Percival is clashing with Pram and going on and on about his grudge against him. But Pram didn't come here to chat. He came to assert dominance, and that is exactly what he does as Percival can't even lay a finger on him now that he has his ideal sword. Percival realizes that he is greatly outmatched in combat ability, but he doesn't understand how Pram could have gotten so strong since the last time he fought him. He could really use some backup from Donna right about now. But Donna is currently busy walking down Romantica. As a magician, she's at a great disadvantage against Donetta in close combat, so she needs to find another way to get the edge on him. Luckily, the aftermath of Desir and Azes' fight causes fog to fill the room, and simultaneously giving her the edge she needed to even the playing field against Donetta. His vision is obscured by the fog, however. Romantica's radar gives her all the information she could ever need about the location of her opponent, and she is able to snipe at him despite the fog. Donna realizes he is against the ropes here and needs to do something about it, so he puts on an artifact which causes the fog to dissipate. Romantica recognizes it as the same one he had originally given to her as a gift, but now he says it's too good for her since she's a commoner. She's getting sick and tired of all this commoner and noble talk over and over again. Donna loses a few screws as he begins to rant that nobles are superior to commoners in every way, in class, in strength, and talent, so much so that they might as well be two different species. At this point, she realized no amount of talking would ever get through to Donada because he is simply crazy. And the worst type too, a crazy person with a magic ring gun. He uses the ring to cast fire around Romantica. While she evades at first, she gets blasted away immediately after. Pram runs over to check in her and she is mostly alright since she managed to block a majority of the blast. But she is still out of mana so she asks Pram to take over while she recovers. However, Donata wasn't done yet and resumed his charge by using magic to trap Pram in a rock while he attempts to kill Romantica again. But before he could do that, Pram busts out and gets in his way, slashing at him and causing his retreat. Percival yells at Donetta for fighting Pram since he is the one that has beef with the boy, but one look in Donetta's eyes and Percival could tell Donetta was too far gone. Donetta was solely focused on cleaving Romantica's ass with his sword, which is what left him open to be attacked by Pram. And while he may be a tough opponent, Pram thinks he can exploit that single-minded goal of his. Romantica analyzes the situation and thinks there is no way she could ever handle Donetta. While her magic is depleted and in her current state, she would only be a liability to Pram, so she asks him to leave her to face Donetta alone. Pram listens to her and says, I understand you made a decision, but I'm going to overrule it on the count of it's a dumbass decision. She will guarantee get clapped hard if she has to face Donetta for even another minute alone so Pram isn't going to leave her side until the fight is over. Upstairs, Desir and Azes clash once more with Azes throwing the first spell. However, Desir easily hacks that and turns it into nothing. Azes then uses a mobility spell to try and close the distance, but with a snap of his fingers, that too is inverse and destroyed. Nothing she throws at him seems to work but he is still able to use spells against her and catches her off guard with a flame tornado. However, Azest is no side character, so it'll take more than that to take her down. She can't understand why she is struggling against Desir. She is stronger, faster, and has more mana than him. Yet she can't land a decisive blow, and is on the back foot of this fight. If there were anything she was lacking in, it would have to be actual battle experience, since Desir seems to have a whole lot of that. Azest is annoying that he is even able to handle close quarters combat despite being a magician. But that doesn't mean he has the same amount of power she does since she is still able to blow him back several feet into a wall. He compliments her on her amazing power, but she isn't in the mood to chat and comes back in for another strike. She swings at Desir over and over, but none of her blows ever connect, and she can't understand why. She is definitely stronger than him and they are the same age, so how is Desir giving her so much trouble? After they separate for a moment, Desir asks if she's having fun. In the previous timeline, she always had a bored expression on her face because she never had an opponent who truly pushed her to be the best she could be. While she won't admit to having fun, she does say that she wishes to beat Desir, so she's going to use everything she's got at her disposal. She's done playing around and uses her trump card domain expansion Frozen Throne. This is the vision magic that Aesis was so famous for and even Desir was unable to ever successfully inverse. 
SS warns Desir to be on guard as she starts her attack and dozens of ice spikes rise from the ground, nearly impaling Desir. But as he manages to evade, he's cornered by even more ice constructs and looks up to see a wall of magic circles, all primed to fire at him. Azes begins to fire the magic spells and Desir begins inversing to counter them. The frozen throne has the effect of allowing Azes to use her magic without limitations within her barrier. So as Desir destroys her magic circles, she is immediately able to reform them and continue the onslaught on him. It's incredible that she can use it already, but even this won't be enough to stop Desir as he is still able to inverse everything she can throw at him. Azest is growing more and more frustrated by this second, and now the magic circles she had been using to attack are being destroyed faster than they can be made. It doesn't matter how many magic circles she makes, if it is magic that he can analyze, then it will never reach him. Azest realizes she is outmatched by Desir despite their strength gap. Neither her sword, nor her magic are enough it gets to him so what she can do against a man like him. As she watches her magic crumble from Desir's inversing, she gets an amazing idea. If magic or the sword alone can't beat Desir, then what if she combined the two of them? The icy room begins to crumble as Aesis dispels her domain and concentrates her magic on her sword, shocking even Desir who has seen an entire timeline. Her sword glows brilliantly as she is realizing the true potential a magic swordsman can hold. Downstairs, Pram and Donetta are locked in combat while Romantica stands in the background spectating their fight. The craziness in his eyes isn't helping much as all his strikes hit nothing but air. Pram sees an opening in his defenses and runs and kicking him back and against a wall. Pram can tell Donetta is strong and he wouldn't have a guarantee of being able to beat him if he were in a clear state of mind, but they need to finish him off here before Percival inevitably joins in to jump Pram. Unfortunately, that last hit knocked a lot of the crazy out of Donetta, so he realizes he has been acting stupid all this time and asks Percival to lend him a hand. And at that moment, Pram realized he was about to get jumped. Percival picks up his sword and runs straight for Pram with a fire in his eyes. He leaps into the air as Pram gets ready to guard against a strike, but rather than getting close, Percival just chucked his sword at Pram. Pram wasn't dazed by this and easily deflected the flying sword, but he had failed to notice that Donata had snuck up behind them during that whole distraction from Percival. But as Pram was about to turn around to face Donetta, Percival catches his sword and comes in from the opposite side to execute the most coordinated jumping they'd ever done. But their plan failed to account for something, and the time Pram had been keeping Donna busy, Romantika had been able to recover some of her magic and as a result was able to pull off a point-blank wind blast on both of them. Meanwhile, Azest has just fully manifested her magic sword. This is a special technique that can only be used by magic knights, but even then, it usually takes 10 years for one to master it, yet Azest is here manifesting it out of pure spite against Desir. She charges at Desir once more and he tries to use his stone magic to slow her down, but with a magic sword in her hand, it does very little to get in her way. He then tries a fire spell, but that too proves to be ineffective and Azest is growing in confidence, since it seems that Desir can't inverse something like this, so she goes on for the finishing blow. As Desir attempted to block, his knife was cut clean through with Azest's sword pressed against his neck. With excitement in her voice, Azest declared that it was her victory. As she looked up at Desir's face, she saw that he was inversing something after all. But if it wasn't her magic, then what could it be? This entire time, Desir hadn't lost sight of the real goal and was just biding his time until he could fully analyze the clock tower's magic. And once he was able to do that, he shut it off, clearing the quest in the process. Azest looks up to the sky and realizes that though she may have won the battle, she still lost the war. Back in the school, the announcement that the Shadow World has been cleared reaches the crowd, and as it is shown that Desir is the one who cleared it, Professor Bridget could have been happier. But the other guy looks like he is about to cry. He doesn't like the fact that Beta class students won the tournament, so he goes Nuha and calls for an emergency meeting with the headmaster to contest the results of the competition. He accuses Bridget of having leaked the information about the Shadow World to the Beta class students, but of course, his proof is nothing more than trust me bro. There is one who goes along with his delusion to keep the Beta students down, but there are other, more sane teachers who realize there was no foul play at work, especially when the entire tournament was broadcasting live. Still, the class's professor refuses to accept the facts and wants an investigation launched into the matter. The headmaster had listened to everything he had to say and he kind of regrets it because those were three minutes of his life that he will never get back. He tells Ferdman to sit his ass down because he has already decided who the winners are and they are the beta students. Elsewhere in the school, Desir is having a chat with Azes to tell her about the plans he used to win the tournament. The main objective of his party was to whittle down the number of Alpha class students to nine and setting them up to fight each other. But Azes saw through that plan easily, so they went on to plan B. 
With the members of Blue Moon so focused on fighting them, they had forgotten all about the quest to clear the Shadow World. He had arrived at the Clock Tower ahead of time and tried to analyze the spell in it, but he didn't have enough time since it was such an ancient magical device. So he had to simultaneously analyze it while fighting Azes to get it done in time. This just makes Azes upset at herself since she had been putting her all into that fight, but Dizir was focused on the bigger picture instead. She accepts that Dizir is simply that good and she lost their battle, but that's only the case because she didn't, didn't go for the head. Pram and Romantika show up, interjecting and saying if Dizir had been defeated, that they would have stepped up to fight in his place. They had already defeated Percival and Donetta by that point anyway. They both sit beside Dizir, claiming him as their man to assert dominance over Azist, and Dizir can do nothing but smile at their possessive behavior. He looks to Romantika and thanks her for all of her hard work since they only managed to win thanks to her sniping most of the opponents. She gets embarrassed by the praise Dizir was giving her and Pram was eagerly awaiting his reward for his work. Dizir gives him all the head pats he could want, but Romantika gets jealous so he gives her head pats as well. She is really enjoying it until she remembers she is supposed to be the Tsundere, so she tells him to knock it off, but they're still having fun regardless. Aziz sees how much fun they are having and smiles before getting up to leave. Ferdman called her into a meeting because she lost the tournament, but before she leaves, she has a favor to ask of him. Even though she knows it's selfish of her to ask, she wants to be included in the next training session Dizir will be holding. And while Pram and Romantika are both against it, Dizir would love nothing more than to have Aziz train with them. After that, they all head to see Professor Bridget and Romantika is pretty nervous, because even though they won, she knows the nobles will continue to keep the commoners down. But this time fairness prevailed and all three of them have become single rankers, and as such have been promoted to Alpha class. With their most recent victory in being promoted to Alpha class, Romantika thought it necessary to bring all of them out to have some fun in town. But Dizir doesn't think this is a good use of their time since they will be joining Alpha class after the break is over. But that is precisely why Romantica thinks it is important for them to use this time to have fun while they can since they will likely be up to their necks and work by the time their break is over. Plus, she really doesn't want to have to work today so both she and Pram plead with him to let them have the day off until he finally caves and agrees to have fun. The first stop on their fun outing is a trip to the store for an outfit makeover. Romantica tries on several outfits and puts on a fashion show for Desir and Pram. But while Pram seems to be into it, Dizir has very tame reactions to her fashion sense, so she asks him to act a little more excited about it, while she puts on another outfit that we will never see her wear again. She comes back out, and this time Dizir seems really enthusiastic, saying how great he thinks the outfit looks, but while Romantika was soaking in the praise, it turns out that he wasn't talking about her, but rather Pram. Next up, Pram was selecting a tie for Dizir, and has had this man standing there for who knows how long. It's just a tie, but the way Pram was having a full-on debate with himself, you'd think he was talking about nuclear launch codes or something. Dizir can't do anything but smile while his legs atrophy away, so he looks to Romantika for help, but she isn't willing to get in Pram's way here. After Pram was done picking out a tie for Dizir, and they had scheduled a visit to the chiropractor for Dizir's back, they head out of the mall exhausted, but Pram seems as happy as can be. They spot something else they want to do so Romantika and Pram run off in that direction to have more fun, while Dizir stands back wondering how they have so much energy. As he is standing there, he notices Azes there as well and is surprised that she is the kind of person to come to the mall for fun. There is a brief awkward silence since Azes isn't one to make small talks, so Dizir asks her if she would like to join them to have some fun for the day. And she takes that to mean she's getting a rematch for the tournament, but Dizir doesn't want this to turn into a whole battle. Luckily, Azes was only joking about wanting a rematch and she'd be happy to have some fun with them. Over by the claw machine, Pram pulls off the impossible and actually gets the machine to give him a prize on the first try. They are both celebrating their win when they notice Dizir with Azes standing next to him. This gets them both into feral cat mode as they see the threat of Azes stealing their man so Azes analyzes the situation, calmly picks Pram up and puts him beside Dizir. This gesture gets the hostile Pram to accept her into their pack, but Romantica remains against her. Dizir decides it might be a good idea to play a game as a team to reduce tension, so he pairs up with Romantika against Azes and Pram. But this match is going to be anything but friendly as Pram has murder in his eyes over not being the one paired with Dizir, so he plans to end this game quickly so they can switch teams. He starts the game off with a powerful strike and it's almost too fast for Dizir to keep up with, but as it gets to Romantika, she has a secret move up her sleeve. Cheating. She uses wind magic to make her strike score and Azus isn't about to go out like that just because of silly rules so she cheats as well with ice magic and it just evolves from there. 
After the match, they say goodbye to Azes and she thanks them for the fun game today. And while Romantika had fun as well, she's glad she doesn't have to deal with Azes anymore. But in actuality, she's going to see her almost every single day since she'll be joining their training and they'll be in the same class from now on. Once the school break is over, the group arrives in Alpha class and is amazed by the luxury of the class when compared to that of Beta class. It's a huge difference, but they work hard to get here so it's deserved. But even if they've achieved their goal and are in Alpha class now, Desir isn't going to let them stop their daily training sessions. As they are about to begin, Azaz comes in to join and they all get down to business with a long training montage of a training plan that Desir came up with. By the end of the day, Azaz is thoroughly impressed by Desir's capabilities as an instructor. He accurately identifies each person's strengths and adjusts the training accordingly, arguably better than a lot of the professors here could ever manage. Desir takes the praise well and tells Azaz that they'll meet up again after class, but for now, they've got to get ready before class begins. Romantika is tuckered out, but Desir reminds her that they don't have much time left. He had informed both of them of a danger that was fast approaching, and if they are not strong enough to handle it, someone could actually die from it. He knows it will be tough, but he's asking for them to trust him for now. Class begins and the teacher is explaining the history of the Shadow World while the cameraman is really earning his paycheck with these angles. The Shadow Worlds have played their continent for a long time now, reducing the available land to half of what it used to be. However, the success rate for clearing Shadow Worlds is currently at almost 100%, so they have managed to halt the contamination from spreading any further. This is thanks to the power of magic gems, which are crystals of mana that appear once a Shadow World has been cleared. They contain an incredible amount of mana, but they can't be used in their natural states. That was until 50 years ago when the technology to process and use the magic gems was developed by the Magic Tower. And as a result of the vast amounts of mana harvested from these crystals, new and advanced technology has been invented. And this technology was invented by. You know what? Well, let Romantika answer this one. The teacher calls on Romantika because she was asleep in class and then asks her to answer the question. She obviously doesn't know what the answer is and is about to receive classroom trauma. But Desir comes to her aid, informing her that the answer is Zod Xerian. The teacher sighs and says her answer is correct, and soon after, the bell rings, meaning the class is now over. After class, Desir brings Pram and Romantika over to talk to Professor Prelude, however, she doesn't recognize them at first. After Desir introduces himself, she realizes he was the winner of the tournament and became a single ranker. But even if she knows who he is, it doesn't change the fact that she doesn't know what they want. So Desir clears it up, saying he has a favor to ask of her. They move the conversation to a meeting room where Professor Prelude asks for some more details on this favor he would like to ask for. Desir pulls out a piece of paper from his jacket and slides it across the table. It is a request form and he would like Professor Prelude to fill it out so his party can be hired to protect the Magic Tower. She is confused by the nature of this request, but rejects it because she has no reason to assign any extra protection there. To persuade her, Desir reveals that he knows about the tier of Radronal being stored in the Magic Tower. This gets Prelude's attention because Desir shouldn't be able to know about that, but he continues saying that if nothing is done in 10 hours, the tier will be stolen by the Outers. His knowledge of both the tier and the Outers that have been trying to steal it sparks suspicion in Prelude, especially since he was in beta class a few days ago, so there is no way he would have come anywhere near any of the things he is talking about, but there is no time to explain why he knows this. He just needs her to trust him. The day of the attack Desir predicted has arrived, and we see a hooded man running through the streets at night. He bumps into a man and falls to the ground, dumping his bread in the process. Upon realizing what happened, the poor man apologizes profusely for his mistake, and surprisingly, the second man is actually pretty nice to him considering he looks like a noble. He asks if the young man is alright while stretching out his hand to help him up. He can tell the boy is in a hurry, but asks what could have him running around so late at night. So the boy explains that he was out to get bread for his siblings who are likely starving by this point. And after hearing the full story, the noble gets back into his peasant-hating character and proceeds to throw the bread on the ground and stomp it out while lightly threatening the peasant. The peasant is left in a pitiful state as the noble walks away, and as he leaves, one of the assassins he had assigned to guard him asks if he wants the peasant dead, but he's gotten his full of cruelty for the night, so he chooses to let the peasant live. The man makes it to the front gate of the magic tower and dons a mask, ready to begin his operation. He and his army of assassins menacingly stand at the entrance, and I guess stealth isn't a requirement for their goal. They all begin firing magic blasts in unison at the magic tower, but as you would expect from something called the magic tower, it has a magic barrier surrounding it completely, and as a result their magic is doing no damage. The man had expected a barrier of such unparalleled strength, but even if it has made the magic tower, it will be unable to defend against two different types of attacks at once, so he sends another team in to perform physical attacks on it. 
And as they pound away at the barrier, there is a spectacular CGI light show before it finally fails and allows them entry. The people in the Magic Tower finally realize that there are people trying to break in and come out with weapons in hand to defend the tower, but rather than immediately engage in combat, they form a line on both sides to let their leader come through to the front. The man stands in front of them all and complains that they are making this harder than it needs to be, but one look at them, and you can already tell that these guys wouldn't be able to defend a flower from a bee, so he just orders his men to take them down. The guards start firing off magic spells at them, but the intruders came prepared with a shield that negates it. So it was now down to physical combat, and not gonna lie, these guys are holding their own against the intruders, much to Kraken's shock. But in all the confusion the battle creates, he and a smaller team plan to sneak off to find the tear and steal it. He activates a magic spell that turns them all invisible, and they fade into the chaos. They arrive in the corridor leading to the tier, and Kraken gloats about how dumb the magic tower is to have fallen for his plot, yet something still bothers him. The way the soldiers responded to their invasion, it was far too efficient. It is almost as though they had been expecting some form of attack to happen. His suspicious thoughts are interrupted as they finally arrive at the door to the storage room. In the room, they find what must be the tier surrounded by a barrier, and Kraken orders them to get into position and fire magic at the already established magic-resistant barrier. After that inevitably failed, he orders them to step back as he walks right up to the barrier and casts a powerful spell right up against it, actually managing to break through its defense. The casing is easily destroyed after that and Kraken is eager to grab a hold of the tear floating right before his eyes. However, as he was about to get his grubby little fingers all over it, he hears a voice yelling for him to stop. The voice belongs to Pram who has his sword prime and ready for combat unless they surrender. Kraken wonders who this sassy child is and does the smart thing and pockets the tear just in case something goes wrong. He then turns to Pram, asking him how he knew about them. But when Pram remains silent, he just orders his men to kill him. They gear up to kill this single child and begin casting their spells, but with Pram's speed, they have no shot of ever so much as grazing Pram. Kraken is impressed by Pram's moves, now sure that this isn't just any regular child. They've got two swordsmen and four mages who fire their magic at Pram, but with a speed gap, he is able to slash their spells down to nothing and close the distance to knock them out in a non-lethal, but definitely concussion-inducing manner. While Pram was distracted with that, Kraken cast a spell to trap him in place, binding his hands and feet long enough for him to cast another spell and punch Pram away with a pillar of stone. Kraken applauds Pram for his quick moves, but he seems to be lacking in actual battle experience, and it's showing. Kraken cast another binding spell, but this time Pram was prepared for it and dodged backwards to evade, however, what he wasn't prepared for was the trap that Kraken had set up behind him, so as soon as he stepped in it, he was surrounded by walks of stone and effectively cornered with nowhere to run to. This is what a lack of battle experience can get you, and Kraken thinks he has pretty clearly won this one, but as luck would have it, Romantika intervenes just in time to save Pram from a gruesome death. She then unleashes several wind blasts, all aimed at the intruders, and knocks a couple of them out before the rest can manage to put up their magic shields. The power of the spells isn't exactly lethal, but their speed are extraordinary. Plus, with the sheer volume of the spells makes him think that there have to be more than one spellcaster here helping Pram. He can't understand how his perfect plan could have gone so wrong or how they managed to get information on his attack ahead of time, but thinking calmly, he remembers that he's already got what he came here for, so he can just leave instead of staying to fight a losing battle. He tells what's left of his team to guard him while he finishes his last spell, but as Pram sees what they are doing, he charges at them, and those guards do so a shit job at guarding. However, the last one seems fairly competent in battle, and doesn't get immediately decimated by Pram, also managing to hold him off long enough that Kraken had successfully completed his spell and has several rock shards flung at high speeds at Pram. Pram darts around the room to evade, but the rain of rocks is incessant and follows him no matter where he goes. With no defense against the rock, Pram starts running towards Kraken hoping to take down the spellcaster and this, but as Kraken sees him coming, he destroys the floor beneath him in an attempt to stop Pram, and in the process, he does his last guard dirty. And to make it worse, it didn't even do anything to stop Pram since he just jumped back before he could get caught in it. Pram can't believe he just killed his ally, but Kraken doesn't see it as a big deal, since he could always just get more people like him. Pram won't stand for such blatant disrespect for a comrade even if it is between enemies so he charges forward while leaping over the gap to strike. However, Kraken blocks and compliments Pram's swordsmanship, but isn't going to be enough to win this battle. He knocks Pram away and gathers tons of rocks around his body, forming an impenetrable shield around his body, so no matter how many times Pram swings at it or chips away, it will always reform around him meaning Pram's close-range attacks are effectively useless now. 
And as Romantica tries some more magic attacks from a distance, he is able to pinpoint her location and send rocks flying to force her out of hiding. He never would have thought his heist would be ruined by high schoolers, so he asks who the mastermind was behind their defense. They clearly knew that he was going to be here today, so he wants to know who could have possibly told them, but there's no way Romantica or Pram would ever just say it because they were asked, so Kraken declares that he will make them feel pain so extreme that they would wish they were dead. He launches several rocks at Romantica, but Pram sees it coming and runs past Kraken to get to the rocks first and destroy them before they can hit their target. With the two side by side now, Romantica fires off three more wind blasts at Kraken, but he only laughs, saying while her spell casting is impressive, her magic is far too weak to do any real damage with a wind spell. So she takes his advice and switches to rocks as well so the two send stones flying at each other with great speed. This creates a dust cloud which Pram is able to take advantage of to get in close and attempt a final blow, but his attack is caught by Kraken who has one final trick up his sleeve. He uses his trump card to completely destroy the floor surrounding him, and then just dips out. Pram and Romantica just barely manage to escape the spell and crawl out from under the rubble. They got their asses handed to them even though it was a two-on-one, making them realize just how much more they've got to train to get stronger. Meanwhile, as Kraken was making his escape, he looks at the tear and says things didn't go exactly to plan, but what matters the most is that he has gotten what he came for. So it is his victory, but Desir shows up and refutes his claim. He was the poor bred boy and has come to stop Kraken once and for all. Kraken asks how Desir could have possibly known where to find him, so he shows that when they had touched hands back out on the street, he had marked Kraken with his mana and tracked him down in this location. Kraken then realizes that Desir must be the mastermind behind this entire operation, and while he is impressed that he was able to pull this off, he still can't have him getting in his way so he begins to cast his magic, but we all know magic isn't going to work on Desir. As Kraken's magic crumbles before him, he is left in utter shock as he realizes that he is unable to deploy his spell, and there could only be one reason for such a thing to happen. Desir must have inversed his spell in that instant, but that should have been impossible. Kraken refuses to accept this and goes all out with his rock spells aimed at Desir, but once again, he inverses them and isn't even grazed. He tells Kraken that it's pointless to try and hit him with any kind of magic because it will never last long enough to reach him, and Kraken is starting to get the picture here. As Desir begins to walk closer to him, Kraken pulls out the crystal tear and threatens to destroy it if he takes so much as one step closer, but Desir takes two steps and dares him to do it if he wants to. Kraken is taken aback when his bluff didn't work and doesn't know what to do anymore since he has no magic. So as Desir pounces on him, he makes one final desperate attempt to punch Desir in the face, but gets hit with gravity magic and brought down to his knees. Kraken can't believe how badly he is getting beaten by Desir when he is just supposed to be a student. There should be no reason a student would be able to cast such high-level magic instantly like he just did, but here he is and Kraken can do nothing to fight back. Furthermore, as Desir takes the crystal tear, Kraken can't believe his eyes as the unprocessed crystal is somehow being used by Desir, even though that goes against everything that is known about these crystals, but Desir feels no need to explain how he managed to pull this off. He increases the output of the gravity magic and has Kraken face down ass up, but in the face of defeat, Kraken resolves himself not to go out like a bitch, so he activates the hidden properties of his mask and is able to break free from Desir's magic. He gets up and is fully transformed by the mask into this thing, and Desir points out that he looks even worse now than he did before, kind of like a demonic creature. Kraken corrects him, saying he doesn't just look like one, he is actually a demonic creature before running up to Desir and punching him through a wall. That blow could have been fatal, but Desir managed to put up his magic shields in time to keep himself alive. Kraken comes busting through the wall after him and attempts a slashing claw strike, but Desir evades just in time to not end up like the wall behind him. However, he wasn't able to evade the follow-up strike from Kraken as he is kicked into another wall at high speed. But while Kraken is looking all pleased with himself, he realizes that Desir had struck his thigh with a flame spear in the moment he was kicked. Desir's entire body is reeling in pain and he is disappointed his flame spear didn't do as much damage as he had hoped it would as Kraken is immediately back in the fight and pushing him back with his powerful strikes. So far, Desir has managed to evade the strikes, but he gets backed up into a wall and there is nowhere left to dodge to, so he is a sitting duck. But as Kraken launches another punch, Desir ducks down and delivers a point-blank Inferno Blast to him. However, the blast does no damage at all, and Kraken just counters with a rock spell from behind, punching Desir's back and sending him flying. Desir seems to be at a great disadvantage here because while this form gives Kraken frightening physical abilities, he is still able to use magic and Desir can't handle both at once. 
Kraken launches a tandem attack with his fists and his magic, not giving Dazir even a moment to inverse it, and steadily overwhelming him before sending him flying upwards on a rock pillar. With him in the air, Kraken plans to have him impaled on his rock spikes, but as he was falling, Dazir had just enough time to inverse it. Kraken is impressed that Dazir had managed to survive up to this point, but with his next spell, he plans to finish him off. He charges up his ultimate rock hammer, and as Dazir tries to inverse it, it just reforms itself so that won't work. Kraken completes it and charges at Dazir with full power, so to counter, Dazir creates a heavily layered shield that holds him off at first, but eventually gives way to the overwhelming power Kraken wields. Believing he had won, Kraken laughed to himself over the stupidity of Dazir to challenge him to a fight, but from the dust cloud in front of him that distinctive red spark can be seen as Kraken realizes he celebrated a little too early. Dazir has finally fully inversed the magic hammer of Kraken. It may have taken him a little longer than usual since the magic is new to him, but he's now gotten the full grasp on everything that Kraken could possibly throw at him so that he is ready for a counterattack. He begins to inverse the magic in the body of Kraken and leaves him far weaker than he was before while also using the power from the Crystal Tear to power a powerful final attack, a huge fireball. As the blast hits Kraken, his armor is destroyed and he somehow doesn't have first-degree burns all over his body, but he has been defeated and collapsed wondering who Dazir truly is. Dazir doesn't know for sure who he is, but one thing he does know is that he is going to protect the people he cares about. After his heroic action, Dazir is seen on an elevator with Professor Prelude. She asks if he is really alright with this being his prize after protecting something as important as the tear, but Dazir assures her that this is what he wants. There is nothing more he could ask for other than a game of chess with the Tower Master. Prelude thinks his request is pretty strange, but then again, he has the right to ask for anything he wants. Besides, it's not like he's the only strange one since the Tower Master actually agreed to such a request in the first place. They get to the Tower Master's room and Prelude tells Dazir that she will be waiting outside, so please don't be rude to the Tower Master while he's in there. Dazir enters the room and is greeted by the Tower Master Zodig Zarian. Otherwise known as the strongest mage in the present day as well as the future, as well as his dear beast friend. Zod notices Dazir is awfully silent, but Dazir says he's fine so they begin their chess game. Zod would have liked to take his time and enjoy the game, but he's got another meeting in 27 minutes so he's going to have to rush a bit. He asks which rule set Dazir would like to play with, and Dazir answers Erebel's rules which catches Zod off guard. He says it's unusual for him to play that since not many people around here are capable of playing that, but if that's what Dazir wants, then they'll play 5D chess. Dazir thinks back to when he first learned about this version of the game, from Zod himself in the future, though he was kind of forced to learn it, but it has become one of his fond memories. They begin the match and Zod says he is impressed with Dazir's skill, but he doesn't think this is going to take too long before he loses. Dazir suggests that they make a wager which intrigues Zod as he proposes that the loser must fulfill a request from the winner, but Zod refuses since there isn't much a student like Dazir would be able to do in terms of granting his request. Dazir looks around the room for a moment and notices some unprocessed crystals over on Zod's desk, asking if he can use them. Zod allows it so Dazir grabs one in his hand and begins using the unprocessed crystal and Zod can't believe his eyes. He wants to know what Dazir did, but before that, now that Dazir had something that Zod wants, he reproposes the previous wager. Zod sees that Dazir means business so he agrees, stating that if he wins, Dazir has to tell him how he did that with the crystal. He then asks what Dazir's wish could be, but Dazir chooses to keep it to himself until he wins this game, so he will be going all out and unleashing his inner Magnus Carlsen. Meanwhile, at Ferdman's villa, he is holding a party at which Azes is in attendance, but she clearly doesn't want to be there since she is just standing on the balcony the entire time. Ferdman comes out to call Azes back into the party since there have been rumors going around that she didn't win the ranking tournament, but she doesn't see what the problem is since she actually did lose to Dazir, so there is no point in trying to cover it up. Ferdman blames her for this whole mess and says none of this would have happened if she had just beaten Dazir like he told her to. He then says if she has a problem with him and she should just leave already and get out of his blue moon party. Aziz thinks about it for a second, and after realizing that would mean she would be able to join Dazir's party, she goes understandable, have a nice day and drops her pin on the ground, showing that she has quit the blue moon party. Back with Dazir, he congratulates Pram and Romantika for doing a good job against the outers since they played a huge role in stopping them from getting away with the tear, but Romantika can't really be happy about it because truth be told, they had their asses handed to them against Kraken. She understands that if she wants to move forward, they can't stay weak, and Pram does as well, but he asks Dazir why he is so fixated on making them as strong as possible. 
Dazir decides it's time to let them know his reasons and informs both that in 13 days, a Shadow World outbreak will happen. This is not going to be a simulation, and if they fail to clear it, then the destruction of the world is going to be greatly accelerated and they will all die. But he will not let that happen, he won't let the timeline repeat itself again. Romanantika and Pram find it hard to believe, but knowing Dazir, it must be true. He is abnormally strong, even though he is meant to be at the lowest circle of magic and thus far, he has predicted events accurately, even though he should have no way of knowing what will happen ahead of time. They want answers to, but they both choose to believe in him as he is so they can become stronger and save the world. The End